right. I got Coach Mills back. He's returning from like a year ago, probably. I think a while ago, years. yeah. Uh, are you still the head coach at James M. Bennett? <laughs> Did anything else I, change? <laughs> I am still the head coach at James M. Bennett High School. They haven't fired me yet. No, I'm. Uh, yeah, we're still coaching. We had our our spring season. Uh, I dubbed myself, if not the state, you know, if not the nation, maybe the worst football coach in the state of Maryland for a variety of reasons. But it was a great learning experience, and we're we're building off of that, and we're excited about the future. But I'm I'm still in the position, uh, enjoying my first actual off season. So I'm looking forward to spending the summer actually getting better at football and not just hanging out at my house. Yeah, we. Uh, we're starting Monday. Monday is going to be like okay because we got done in April, is that mm-hmm. right? And then they started weightlifting, but like people are playing baseball, right? So like, but we're still playing baseball. That's still going to go on for another week or two. But like Monday is like weightlifting speed, and then the following week camp. Mm-hmm. Like they told us to be go back to normal, and it it's so exciting, but it pisses me off at the same time. <laughs> like, what do you mean go back to normal? We just got done. Yeah, it's we we our last game I think was April seventeenth. Um, gave them I think we gave them two weeks off, and we started spring lifting in May. Um, and then yeah, Maryland's being weird with their spring sports this year. Um, they're extending it, so there's a possibility they are some of our guys like two thirds of our roster plays spring sports. Um, they may not be done till almost mid June, so it's like. We're trying to figure out when to start our, our summer training and that sort of deal. Um, but, yeah, we're in that, that spring uh, training right now where it's mostly just weights. And then, yeah, we'll evolve in the next couple of weeks, start working in the the field work stuff and all that good stuff and change the direction. And, you know, I, I hate to use the word agility, but that's what everybody loves. So, you know, speed and agility, if you will. Um, but, yeah, that's where we are, too. And it's just it's a very bizarre time. It's rethinking a lot of things. Um you know, I've always been with our weight room. I've always been, a, you know, I put this on Twitter, huge percentages guy, right? 80% of your one rep max is what we're lifting. But because the spring season's going so long, we essentially lose almost two weeks of prep time during the summer. So if we were going to use percentages, again, none of, most of these guys haven't lifted in over a year. So we'd have to test everybody. That's a whole lost week. And I'm like, well, maybe we'll make that switch to a RPE or whatever this year and kind of see how that goes and see if that, works for us so we don't have to test at the beginning and we'll just test at the end and use percentages going into the fall but it's uh, i got to rethink still having to adapt and we're almost like you said quote back to normal yeah that's what happened to us we certain districts school districts were able to lift in the fall back in the fall Mm -hmm. ours didn't so literally like you said our football team didn't see the weight room until february when we had contact days then we tried to lift every day and they were just like, oh, my goodness, these kids got weaker. Mm-hmm. And this is rough. And they're sore. And so now we're going to hit the ground running again. So I'm really worried about injuries. That's, I mean, we had the, so we didn't even get, to, so we saw them for three weeks in the summer and then three weeks in the fall. And that was it. And then we saw them the very first day of practice in February. <laughs> we had no no lead up of strength and conditioning. And that's exactly, what, you know. And originally we were supposed to do one scrimmage in four games, um, which I thought was reasonable. Uh, And then in the, you know, 11th hour, like four days before the season started, we got word we were going to no scrimmages in seven games. And as soon as they told us that, I said, somebody's getting hurt. And I wish I hadn't been right. Um, We had a a significant amount of injuries and, um, you know, which I think anybody with any sort of experience could have predicted, Um, you know, fortunately, we kind of dodged the bullet. We had really only one kid who had a significant injury, but his kind of was pre-existing, um, and it just got exacerbated early. I mean, he was only with us maybe a week, um, you know. So other than that, we avoided any serious injuries. Uh, we had a few almost serious injuries. Um, you know, game six, I could have lost my QB one for next fall as well, but fortunately, the injury wasn't near as bad as originally thought. Um, but yeah, and that's kind of what we're looking at for our summer training. Like how hard can we push them, um, without pushing them too hard and trying to find that balance of, you know, allowing them to rest and recuperate, but still getting stronger. Cause that was one of our big issues. I mean, I, I, as all coaches would say, um, but you know, was because of that lack of training was lack of strength. And 
one of the local doctors around here was seeing a lot of injured athletes and they actually did um, a study and they did blood samples on all the injured athletes. And what they, they came back with, all of them had vitamin D deficiencies. And the two ways you get vitamin D is spend time outside and resistance training. Neither of those things happened from about uh, August on because they were stuck inside with <laughs> digital learning and they weren't in the weight room, you know, except the ones who were self-motivated enough to do it. But as you know, dealing with high school athletes, those kids are less common than we would hope. Uh, the ones who are willing to go get in the weight room and, and do it on their own to a good level. So, um, but yeah, so we're hoping we can kind of rebuild this summer and, and get back into it in the fall and minimize those injuries and, and really make kids uh, you know, I hesitate to use the word bulletproof, but as bulletproof as possible, um, you know, kind of our theory is we want to do everything we can to prevent those soft tissue injuries, those pulls, those strains and that sort of stuff. Contact injuries can be mitigated through strength uh, and muscle growth, but realistically, some of them are still going to happen. Um, you know, so hopefully we can rebuild the point where we're not having to worry about those, those pulls and those tears and everything. Yeah. And, it sounds like you guys had the same thing with us. Like they crammed basketball, uh, baseball, football from beginning of February until two weeks from now. Mm -hmm. Just crammed. Yeah. We didn't even play basketball. They canceled winter sports. So the first sports oh. to play since March of last year were winter sports, which started the first week in February, maybe second week in February. I don't know. Um, and then we played – Nine weeks of winter sports, so seven games, two weeks of practice. And then, yeah, we finished – our last game was April 17th. That was the same day spring sports started. So, yeah, some of these kids have started February 2 and haven't had a break since then as well. So we got – that all factors in. So it's it's different and, you know, it's challenging. It's interesting. But I hope I never have to freaking do it again. No, uh, we start – they – Something happened January 20th, a couple days later, <laughs> drop of a hat. They said, hey, if you meet these requirements, go. Mm -hmm. So then when you're re when they put Illinois into regions, if your region met this criteria with our lovely state, you could do this. So basketball started at the beginning of February, went on to like March 13th. First mm -hmm. football practice was March 3rd. Mm -hmm. So then they said you have to have, if you're playing basketball, you had to have 10 practices in or seven. I don't remember. If you didn't play basketball, you got to have more in. Mm -hmm. So those kids that are playing basketball when football started March 3rd, depending on what school you were in, you're like, you're going to not have these kids till March 13th. Right. Because there were coaches, basketball coaches that I want to go until then. And there's the dog. See, I told you we're having a dog. <laughs> um, so literally from beginning of February, if they played three sports, they went on until like March 10th. Some basketball ended. They're doing football. And then three weeks into football, four weeks into football, because you got a week and a half or two of practice, first game, two or three games in, four games in. Oh, spring starts. So you get kids going to baseball, going to track, and going to football. Wow. And now depending now some coaches are mm -hmm. real good about it. So like if they went to baseball, like okay, you're just gonna throw a little bit, but your focus is football. So we're not gonna run you, we're not gonna do anything, you're gonna hit right. the throw. Track is kind of the same thing. Like maybe you'll run a little bit, but if you're doing football, we're not gonna run you. Like if you're mm -hmm. throwing a thrower, great go, but we're not gonna run you. First thing was football, but still, like they had to do both. Yeah. Maryland, you know, I don't like to use the word smart in Maryland and sports all in the same sentence very often. Um, but one of the smart things they did do is they did create individual seasons. So they were condensed. But basically, so we had originally we were supposed to have an individual winter season starting. Originally, the plan was December and then that got punted to Feb or to January and then that got pushed back to nothing. But they had their eight weeks and then winter sports had their eight or nine weeks. And then spring sports. So that way we didn't have that crossover. So, yeah, I mean, that's because you're kind of putting kids in a bad situation. If they do get a coach who's like, no, we're going to practice the way my way. Or you then you're forcing them to pick a sport, which I don't like. You know, let them play it all. They're in high school, man. Enjoy it. But, yeah, I mean, that's kind of screwy to kind of have them overlap like that. But, um, yeah, I, I, not a plan I would enjoy. 
that wasn't their the original plan was which got pushed was basketball's gonna start in November, December, and football was gonna start in February and all that. Everybody's gonna get a season. They'd have like a four days off in between. Right. But when things kept getting pushed back, pushed back. And the original plan was all the sports would be done June 26th. Like by the time we were all done. Mm-hmm. When this happened, when we got the green light, they moved it up to be done June 19th. Mm. So they took like a whole week or so away. So now they're trying to condense it even more. So what we complained about was, well, you got these overlaps. But you took a week and a half away. You could give them, instead of being done, that's what be done March 13th, make it be done March 6th and then start football March 9th or 10th. Like we could do right. that. And then when you're done with that, baseball could start later. Like we didn't understand the thinking, but we were just like, oh, we get to play. So that's what mattered. Mm-hmm. But we just didn't understand it. So, like for track, girls' track here in Illinois, if they go to state, they'll be done June twelfth. Okay. Boys' tracks gonna be done June nineteenth. So if they're going to state and they're in track, they're not gonna be at football until June nineteenth right. or after. So you may not have them until July. When does your season start in the fall? Our first game would be third week in August. Oh wow! Okay, you, so you guys start early. That's going to high school in Indiana. That's how we were too. I remember starting two a days, like end of July, early August. But yeah, we don't start our first day of practice is August eleventh, and our first game isn't until after Labor Day. I have it right here. First game is August twenty seventh. Hmm. Yeah, that's yep. usually when it starts. I, I guess that's a week ahead of us because our that would be our second scrimmage, and our first game would be the following week. Yeah, see, we don't get a scrimmage besides ourselves. Like, I know other schools scrimmage each other. Mm -hmm. Illinois doesn't really do that. Really? We don't get a spring ball. Like, this was the first Illinois spring ball of all time. Like, there's no – none of that. We don't get any of that. Yeah, Um, we don't do – we don't spring ball it, but we we get – we're allowed to have two controlled scrimmages before our first game. I don't know if we – maybe we do, but I've never seen it and I've never been a part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, The only thing I've been a part of was joint practices. Which we were not allowed to do, but then all of a sudden this year they said go for it this summer. <laughs> like it's just it's gone. Like, yeah, I'm not trying to be a conspiracy. I've dove into politics the last few months, which has made my head explode. <laughs> I still don't understand it, um, but it, it's just like I, go back to normal. I worked in politics for like four years, and I still don't understand it. I I can't. I there's a reason I got out of it. It was like you know what does it say when you get out of politics to get into substitute teaching because that's the career move I made. So uh, <laughs> that's how much I was prepared to get out of it. Well, it was, I, uh, I was just tired of some things. I was like, maybe I need to educate myself on some things. And then you dive in. I don't full. How do I put this? I'm listening to podcasts. I'm trying to read books. I'm trying to do this. Mm-hmm. Some of it I don't understand. And then I find myself leaning one way and I'm like, but are they right? So I want to go to the other way and see what they mm-hmm. say. Then I'm like, why is it just the going this way or this way? Where's the other, like, where's another spot? Um, I got made, I got some crap because Dan Crenshaw, I was like, he seems interesting. Let me look at him. <laughs> Let me get his book and read it. And somebody goes, oh, so you, you think this way. And I said, no, I don't know. Don't tell yeah. me my life. I mean, kudos to you to, to look at on both sides. I mean, I think that's what a lot of people miss out on, you know, and, and I certainly grew up on one side of the aisle and, you know, through my own experiences, I'm kind of, I would say I'm politically amorphic um, in regards to, you know, I'm going to go with what I think is right mm-hmm. in the given time. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's a big thing for me is, you know, understanding perspectives. And there's going to be times that people on one side, I think, Hey, they've got an interesting perspective that I agree. With. There's going to be people in, and unfortunately, at least on the internet, I believe that is a lost way of life. I think the vast majority of us, you know, and I, and I consider people I hang out with quote unquote average Americans. I think all of us are somewhere in that middle. You know, we might be more one side, more the other, but most of us, like we're, just, we're trying to go about our lives, live our lives, do our jobs and, and, you know, take care of our families. And, you know, we're in that, that middle area, so to speak. Um, but you get online, man, or you watch TV and it's, you have to be one side or the other. And I'm like, why? That doesn't make any sense, you know? And I teach government for God's sake. Like, you know, like that's what I teach. And even I'm like, you know, I, I don't know about all this. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't know yeah, how I got into, poli- 
I don't know how I got into politics. I don't know how I went that way. Um, well, like you said, because there's some stuff you cared about. Well, just with everything going on, I was like, let me really mm-hmm. look into this and dive into it. And maybe I shouldn't have done Joe Rogan's podcasts to do that, but <laughs> but that's how it started was I was listening sure. to some of them and I'm like, well, they get three hours to talk about themselves rather than mm-hmm. five minutes on TV. Mm-hmm. So I went that way. Um, that's why I like, like sports po- like sports podcasts with coaches. They get an opportunity to talk more about themselves. We don't have to watch the five, 10 minute clip. So sure. some of these politics, congressmen, people, I'm like, let me listen. And like Dan Crenshaw, for example, I listened to him on Joe Rogan. I was like, he's interesting. Let me listen to him. And then I get his book and I put a picture of it. I'm like, this is just my next read, whatever. And someone goes, yo, you think this way? And I'm like, what? Mm-hmm. And it's whatever you think. I think one way or the other, I don't care. I'd rather the right thing get done. So that's right. why with the COVID stuff, I just want the right thing to be done for the kids. That's where I was going with. See, I, I was going to come back. <laughs> It just didn't seem right to cram all this on the kids. And then you got coaches sure. too. Like we're burnt out. I did basketball, football, and track. Like we're, we are burnt out mm-hmm. and no time off. Like the head coach is like June 7th. And I was like, Oh, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done Thursday. Mm-hmm. Unless I go to state with girls and it's June 12th. Yeah. It's, you know, even I only coached football and I can tell you right now, like that was, probably the three almost, you know, I guess almost three longest months of my life. And part of it was the way things were going for us on the field, but you know, that's a discussion for a later time. Um, But just in general, like, and it wasn't just about the coaching, you know, that was, you know, to me, that was what it's always been. It was really about, okay, we have all these regulations we have to follow. We have all these rules. And then, you know, for us, we're on a County system with our schools. So what our County did was different than what another County did. Well, we have to play other counties. So when we play them and you see different rules being enforced or even in the same county, different rules being applied. And again, I'm not begrudging anybody anything. That's how it was interpreted to their school. So be it. But it was just led to very inconsistent. Um, You know, we were told the beginning of our season, you have to be lenient to kids being late or missing practices. And, And I don't think I don't think many of my players, if any, really abuse that. But there was a lot of, hey, I have to miss practice because I have to watch my brother and sister. Hey, I have to miss practice because I have to do this. I have to miss practice. Uh, my car broke down, so I can't get to practice. All things that you have to deal with that you wouldn't deal with in a normal year, at least as much, because they're already in school. You know what I mean? And they just stop school at the end of the day and they come to football practice. So not having a quote unquote captive audience and having them have to come because we were still hybrid at this time and most of our kids were not hybrid. We've the numbers have increased since then, but the vast majority of my team were not hybrid. And, you know, wondering every day, hey, is this kid going to show up? And you might reach out to them and they might say, yeah, but 30 minutes later that changes, you know, or, you know, whatever the case may be. And, and I don't begrudge them what was happening. Like they can't control it um, except the work one. I have a, 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 you know, heartburn with that, but that's a different story altogether. Um, you know, like, so it was kind of like things we wouldn't have to deal with in a normal year, we had to deal with this year. And that was very difficult, especially coming in as a first year head coach, even though I'd been in the program since 2007, you know, we were doing, you know, I got the job in 29, December, 2019. And from December to March of 2020, things were progressing pretty well. We had decent numbers in the weight room. We were doing great. We had an after school program. We were trying to teach them football concepts and, and the numbers were, were, were pretty good. And then that hit man. And then I didn't see them again from March 13th, until I think the second week in July when we saw them for three weeks and then they randomly shut that down out of the blue. No one ever told us why, but they shut that down. And then I got to see them again for three weeks in November. And and we tried to do things, you know, via Zoom, Google Class. Like it wasn't from lack of effort, but just, you know, it, with the way things were going, at least societally speaking in this area, a lot of them just started to slip through the cracks. You know, we had kids who, didn't turn in assignments for three, four months, despite constant hounding, because there wasn't an incentive for it. And all of a sudden they heard we're playing football. I got multiple messages when they found out we were going to have a season saying, Hey coach, how can I get my grades? Right. I'm like, you got to do some makeup work, my guy. Like you got to figure it out. Like we've been trying to stay on you and you've kind of blown us off. So, you know, and again, part of that was because we didn't have as tight a relationship because we hadn't spent time together and it was kind of a mess. So all those things 
in a normal year you deal with, but on a much smaller scale and everything was blown out of proportion. That was, like you said, exhausting is the word I would use. Just absolutely mind numbing, exhausting. Um, you know, and so I will be glad when we get back to a more traditional schedule. Like we couldn't do in-person meetings um, before pra- we figured out a way like the third or fourth week of practice to have meetings. But in order to do that, we had to sacrifice an on-field practice because we didn't have enough time. Um, you know, so that, as you can imagine, made it very difficult to install, made it very difficult to to teach things. You know, we basically had to teach on the field on the fly. And, um, you know, we had some success, but we're trying we were trying to install new offense, new defense and new special teams. Um, you know, probably. A, quite honestly, though, even if we had kept the same stuff that we had had two years earlier, we would have been installing a new because they hadn't had football in two years. So, you know, I guess in hindsight, it's it really didn't matter as much, but it made it much harder to teach. Um, and it made it harder to build those program things in that you talk about, those culture things, you know, like, you know, just talking about different concepts and stuff like that and, you know, mentoring and leadership. And that's really hard to do when they show up at three o'clock. It's the first time you've seen them all day and then you can't meet with them in person. Uh, and then you wrap up practice at five thirty, and they go straight home because they can't hang out in the locker room. You can't have a post-practice meeting. Like, all the, it literally was just showing up and coaching football, which I know some coaches have wished taught, you know, for years, Hey, I wish I could just show up and coach football, but honestly, it made things a lot more difficult um, for me, I should say, you know, uh, obviously every other coach dealt with the same thing and some of them had great success and kudos to them. Uh, but it was difficult for me and, you know, my staff, cause we were all new. Um, I'm the oldest coach on my staff at 36 years old. Um, and I, me, between myself and defensive coordinator, we have 29 years of experience and the next coach has four. So like we are doing, and and then behind him it's two and then a bunch of coaches who had none. So it was all new stuff, all new staff, never worked together before. And, you know, good guys, good staff, and we're going to be good one day. I have no doubt about that, but just not having the time to sit down and learn with the kids and teach the kids and spend time with them outside of the practice field was kind of tough for me and some of my assistants. So we're looking forward to getting back into that traditional football coaching mindset, so to speak. Yeah, we had the – in October, I saw the kids for two or three weeks, and I told them we we're going to play because I had that mindset. And I mm-hmm. said, their grades, if they're bad now, I don't know what the rules are going to look like. They could come out and say, hey, you don't have to be passing two classes. I don't know. But they could come back and go back to normal and say, you have to be passing five or six classes. So when you're failing and it comes February at the time and you're failing, you ain't playing. They're not going to go back to the last quarter or semester to look at it. Mm -hmm. But the longer it dragged on, you know, and then we were getting to January. We basketball hadn't been done yet. I still even I was like, we may not have a season. Then at the drop of a hat, it happened. That happened. Our head coach was new, too. It was his first year. He'd been there for years. He got the job, and I kept making fun of him. I was like, aren't you glad you took this job? <laughs> and he gave me some words I can't repeat. But that, that happened to us, too. It was and it was some of my linemen. And I'm like, well, coach, I, I emailed the teacher this. And I was like, did you email and say grade this now? Well, yeah. And I said, I hope that teacher takes two months to grade that. Mm-hmm. Because you should have done it. I And then I kept telling him, I told you. I told you we were going to have a season. And I told them it literally could happen tomorrow. And so I had kids ineligible when we first started. As it went on, they got ineligible. Mm-hmm. And I said, you guys are hybrid. How do you fail? It's online. How do you fail? Well, coach. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, coach, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, you know how easy you have it? You don't even have a textbook. That's I was talking to a couple of my uh, co-teachers today, and you know, one of the things we talked about was how what this whole thing kind of really revealed was – hold on a second. Good night, buddy. I love you. He's going up for his bath. Was it revealed that, you know, we as an education system have done a disservice to a lot of these kids because we have – basically spoon fed them for a vast majority of their educational careers, uh, rightly or wrongly, you know, if you ever want to have a long winded educational philosophy, philosophy discussion, I got lots of thoughts on lots of things, but you know, we've kind of spoon fed them and said, Hey, you know, Hey, 
you know, oh, is this too much of a struggle for you? How can we accommodate it? And there's a certain need for that. Don't get me wrong. You know, uh, uh, certain students need certain accommodation. We have to help all students. But now through especially that digital learning, a lot of the education had to be put back on them. And if you weren't a self-starter or somebody who was self-aware enough to realize the help you needed or at least somewhat self-motivated, you fell apart. And it was only so much we can do, you know, like when I'm teaching, I say into Zoom multiple times, hey, if you have questions, man, let me know. Or, you know, I'll type it in the chat and, you know, use all the different methods. But if they don't want to ask questions and, you know, half the time, I don't even know if they're there. They just log on Zoom and, and you know, they have. To, so there has to be a level of self-motivation, which, um, you know, we need to find a way to bring back out of them. And I don't blame them necessarily. The, you know, the system that we kind of built up has kind of taught them that um, in certain regards. Uh, and, and so, you know, now we kind of saw that come to a head. And the great question is going to be, how does this go from here? Because I think there are some great things about online learning that if we could capture, we could use, we could actually strengthen what we do as educators in education. But at the same time, uh, to use it as, as our only means of education, I think, without um, – changing the way we do a lot of things it's 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 a recipe for failure um you know just because it, it leaves a lot of kids out to dry and you know it, it to a certain extent they're not old enough to know what they don't know you know what i mean that's a big thing i say i don't you know once you know what you don't know um it your eyes open up but you, you I almost cursed you remember being 16 17 years old man you thought you knew everything right and you thought oh i got all this in front of me so sir i don't blame them necessarily we need to teach them those skills um and we just haven't taught them that you know we haven't taught them the value of being self-aware the value of being self-motivated and it doesn't mean they're going to be perfect and you know i i'm you know we're not perfect we're, we're older adults and you know we've learned these things and we teach these things but you know, I could tell you right now, I'm looking around my house. There's a lot of things that if I was self-motivated, my house would probably be a little bit cleaner or, you know, would look a little nicer on the outside. But, you know, again, that's a decision I make as an adult, understanding what's a priority. Um, and they don't necessarily have those skills. They're not equipped because we haven't taught them to them. And that's one thing that we're trying to teach through our program and kind of those things that do slip through the cracks. You know, maybe we can help out our 30, 40, 50 kids that we see and, you know, the best we can um, because they don't have those skills as COVID has proven. Um, I remember when they came back hybrid, mm -hmm. if a kid wasn't in person, we all kind of panicked. We're like, where is this kid? They log on to zoom. Well, I miss the bus. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of like, well, now we're, um, what's what I'm looking for. We're encouraging the decision. We're encouraging the behavior. We're, my girlfriend does ABA therapy and own intervention. So mm -hmm. kind of, you know, you're, you're reinforcing this. So when a kid, sure. so like when we all went to school, if we didn't go to school, we got a phone call home, we were absent. Mm -hmm. There was some punishment or consequence. Now when they miss the bus, they're like, Oh, they're present. Cause they're on zoom. Now we're reinforcing this. And a lot of these behaviors that happen with zoom, we reinforced. Now we were all learning at the same time. Like, how is this going to work? When we teach in school, we have zoom and the kids in class. But some of it we reinforced. When our kids came back, middle school, hats on, hoods up there on their phones because that's all they did at home. Right. And we reinforced it. We kind of didn't do anything. We were kind of like, oh, they have to readjust. Two months, three months later, oh, now we got to solve the cell phone problem. What? And I, like I said, I'm worried about curriculum. I'm worried about education. I'm worried about their social. Um, Because these kids, these, some kids came in and didn't know how to say hi. It, like they forgot. Mm -hmm. They forgot how to talk to people. Yeah, a lot of lack of human interaction kind of showed up. You know, uh, kind of had one of those incidents today with a student. You know, it wasn't anything untoward. It's just lack of, you know, interaction probably with adults or, you know, another human. And, uh, you know, yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't even thought about that. Um, you know, so that call kind of falls back on us is, you know, what are we willing to deal with and what are we, you know, what do we decide is important? Like I, I'm different. The, the, the hoodies and hats thing does not bother me in the least bit. Like that's one of those rules that I feel like we created decades ago for a variety of reasons. And I, I don't see the value in it. I'm a big hat guy. So maybe I'm biased. 
Um, you know, and then there's always that, well, it's for security so we can see their faces. I'm like, listen, I've done campus patrol. I could tell you right now, if I see a kid wearing a green hat first period and you say, hey, this person's wearing a green hat, that kid stands out. You know what I mean? It's usually an identifier. Um, so, you know, I don't worry too much about that um, because I know I wear hats indoors, you know, so it's kind of, but yeah, you know, to the same point though, there are things that we do need to be able to deal with. And, you know, hardest part, the cell phone one is a good point because now it's like, I do have kids who legitimately are on my zoom class sitting in my room, but they're looking something up on their phone. I also have kids who are on zoom in my class and are doing something else on my phone. And, you know, it's one of those deals where in a traditional classroom, I would kind of wander around, Hey, what are you looking at this, that, or the other. But now with everybody being hypersensitive and, you know, we can't just, we have to limit in, you know, three feet. I think you were saying earlier, like Mm -hmm. I can't just get up and wander the room. I try to a little bit, but it's not like I can't come look over your shoulder and and see what you're doing. Like I used to do. And, um, you know, so it has been kind of, this is, it's a lost year as I call it, unfortunately. Um, You know, it's really going to be interesting to see how education works in the fall, how that carries over to athletics. Um, you know, how that carries over into the next 40 years of society. Um, You know, I tend to think that this will be a bump in the road more than anything else. Um, But, you know, it's going to be interesting to see the lasting impact that this has, because this has had a huge impact on society and I think has led to kind of some of the other things we have going on right now. People had way too much time, free time the past year. And I think that's led to kind of some of the things Mm -hmm. that uh, we now argue about on the daily. And I'm like, why, why do we care? You know what I mean? Like if, if you want to do it, like I'm a big believer in live and let live, man. Like, you know, if that's what you believe in, that's what you want to do, go for it, live your life, enjoy it. But like you said, going back to that book, like somebody felt the need to tell you that, like, you know what? I see a lot of people looking at stuff on Twitter that, or wherever that I'm like, I don't agree with that. But you know what I do? I keep scrolling, man, because it's not really in my damn business. You know, and I think that's going to be interesting to see. Can we get back to that or reteach that skill? Like, hey, just do you versus kind of what's happened the past year where we want to be in everybody's business and, and all that. So, you know, I don't know. We'll see how that goes. But, um, yeah, definitely be interesting to see how we how schools and athletic programs, because you know, that's a big part of this too. Our athletic program, we're cash strapped right now. We have no, no mm-hmm. money because our the past two years, our biggest fundraiser has been taken away. And then on top of that, we didn't collect admission for home games this year. You know what I mean? So like we are, you know, our, our well is dry when it comes to money, unfortunately. Um, you know, so how are we going to be able to rebound as an athletic program? You know, um, I'm trying to push through some more creative fundraisers to try and generate revenue, but you know how it is if you're creative in education or anything like that, you know, they just kind of uh, say no and move on. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, hopefully I don't annoy people too many times asking them the same thing over and over, but yeah, we definitely in that regard, we're in trouble. So hopefully we can bounce back and, you know, it's, it's going to take a year of normal before we're really back to normal. Um, you know, I'm used to having 80 plus guys in my program. Our high point this year was 52 and we finished the season with 37. Um, I didn't have a JV program and I realistically am not sure about our JV program in the fall, unless I get a bumper crop of freshmen that I don't know are coming. Um, you know what I mean? Because we just don't have the numbers, uh, which sucks because I want those freshmen and sophomores to get playing time. But if we don't have a JV, you know, what do we do? So I think it'll be a, another year before we're really back to a quote unquote normal setting, so to speak. And that's if we don't have any uh, mysterious setbacks all of a sudden. That's another good point you brought up was fundraising. You know, I don't know if people thought about that. We, my school is just a two high school district. So they have Mm -hmm. a little more money, not rich, but like they have a little more from the Mm -hmm. state. But that is a good point. How many sports programs, football, softball, baseball, who couldn't fundraise, they're not going to have any money. You'll just have the coaches, their stipends, and that's it. Like, yeah. Where's that money coming from? And, some of our fundraising has to be close in person and with the social distance or physical distance, whatever you want to call it, you can't do it or they won't let you. Yeah. And, and one of the big things that I would kept told, you know, and again, not to get <laughs> too deep into my thoughts on different things, but you know, their big thing was, well, people have lost their jobs during COVID 
we don't want to be asking them for money if they don't have a job, which again, I, I sympathize with. And I, I, I understand that philosophy, but at the same time, like my philosophy as well, then, you know, say, Hey, you know, we apologize. We're not asking, but you know, there's still people out there who still have the wherewithal and, you know, have the idea of charity and, you know, giving to a school is a, is a charitable donation. Um, you know, so it's kind of a back and forth there, a back and forth that I obviously did not win because I'm just a peon. I'm not a, a decision maker in the grand scheme of things, but, um, you know, I, we're, we're starting to get back to that idea of, you know, normalcy. So I'm hoping that maybe with that fundraising aspect, we can start doing some, some, uh, more traditional fundraisers as well as some, some different ones that we haven't done before. Cause you know, these, these unique quote unquote creative fundraisers, they're things I would do anyway. <laughs> so, you know, now it's just, hopefully I can pull the trigger on them and generate as much revenue as part as possible. Cause Lord knows we need it. I think a lot of people will fundraise, not spend anything this year, save it. And then when they get back to next year, do it again. And then you could start. The coach Steve show is sponsored by the launch pad kickoff tee. If you're a football coach out there, high school, college, NFL, doesn't matter. And you're looking for that edge for your special teams, for your kicker, for the kickoff on sides. You guys need to go to launchpadkickofftee.com. If you have a younger guy trying to develop the kicker, you want the ball to get to the end zone, you need to go to Launchpad Kickoff Tee. This tee gives a coach a strategic options for squib kicks, on sides, everything. It is proven that your kicker will kick off farther. It is legal for NCAA, for high school. Okay. The Launchpad Kickoff Tee is a game changer. So if you go to launchpadkickofftee.com slash CSS to use the code CSS, you can get a Launchpad Kickoff Tee for 10% off. So go to launchpadkickofftee.com slash CSS. You can use the code CSS for the Coach Steve Show to get 10% off. Also, there's a bundle. You can get one for 10% off. You can go to two and get more percent off, or there's an option to buy four. If you click the option to buy the four kickoff tees, if you like it so much, when you use the code CSS, you'll get the fourth one free. So instead of paying full price for all four, you'll get three. So go to launchpadkickofftee.com slash CSS, use the code CSS, get 10% off, buy four to get the fourth one free. This is a game changer, guys. It does more than just hold your balls. Go get the Launchpad Kickoff Tee today to give your kicker an edge for next season. As you guys know, the Coach Steve Show is also brought to you by the Unhinged Sports Network. The Unhinged Sports Network is a 24-hour, seven days a week, nonstop playing uh, radio podcast about any sport that you guys can imagine. They have a proud partnership with Fanatics. So if you go to the link in the description, uh, go to Fanatics, use that link, and go get some gear to support the Coach Steve Show and to support the Unhinged Sports Network. They have deals all the way up to 70% off. They have deals for free shipping, and they have every single sports team you could think of. Your college team is going to be on there. Your professional team is going to be on there. They have good deals on jerseys, T-shirts, hats, socks, anything you want. So please use the link in the description to go to fanatics.com. Save big on your team's gear to help support the un support the Unhinged Sports Network and to support the Coach Steve Show. Doing all that, I would do that if my county didn't have a rule that I had to get my account under two hundred fifty dollars by the first week of June. So I have to spend the money. Well, yep, yep. <laughs> so I mean, don't get me wrong; we're spending it on stuff we need. I'm not just throwing it away to spend it. You know, it's all stuff that we are going to use and you know trying like. A uh, big thing for us is changing the way we teach tackling, um, you know, so talking with some some college coaches and some, uh, you know, guys across the country, like some of the tools we need to be better at teaching and none of them are required. You can teach tackling just with two people. But, you know, as you know, building parts of things into a whole thing is much better than just trying to teach the whole thing all the time. Um, you know, so some of these tools we're getting were things that are going to make teaching parts easier and that sort of deal. Um, so it's all stuff we're going to use. None of it is frivolous, but it's still like, yeah, maybe I would like to have saved an extra five to seven hundred and fifty dollars of it. So in the fall, we could purchase X amount of thing with even more. But, you know, fortunately, we can't do that. See, I try to be simple and smart and then something happens. Yeah, like, that's oh. how it is, man. That's why I'm not a head coach because I couldn't. <laughs> I was 
telling people for the longest time, I'm not a head football coach. I'm a head football facilitator. Yeah, that makes sense. But no, it's a, uh, it's been quite the experience. Um, you know, truth be told, as miserable as it was, we went we went zero and six, and we were not even a close zero and six. We had a couple games where we were in the game till about halfway through the third quarter. Um, you know, our, our our first game was actually a scrimmage. We did pretty well in that. Um, you know, we we pulled our starters early, and then they came back. But it was a scrimmage. I didn't care if we had kept our starters, and we probably win that. <laughs> but again, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, so we struggled on the field. Um, but then again, I'm kind of glad that we went through this because like I told my assistants going in, we're going to try different stuff in the spring and we're going to see if it works. And, you know, we did find some things that work, you know, we did find some things that work for us practice wise. We did find some things that work for us technique wise. We found a lot of things that didn't work and, you know, that's just as good because now we're going to get rid of those things and find new ways of teaching, um, you know, find new sources of information. And I think we've done a pretty good job of that so far in the off season. Um, You know, obviously we still got plenty of time, but, you know, uh, just teaching things from a different perspective than what we taught before. Having that classroom time will be huge. You know, being able to break off in position groups will be huge. Um, But, you know, I I found myself the past couple of weeks watching um, YouTube videos of, uh, the state playoffs in North Carolina, not because I have any vested interest in the state playoffs in North Carolina, but just watching these top teams and specifically watching how do they warm up pregame, you know? Um, and, you know, it's little things like that that I get to focus on now as a head coach uh, versus necessarily the offensive scheme and the defensive scheme, which obviously I'm, I'm immersed in, you know, and I want to be aware of, but kind of a, you know, and I give my input, don't get me wrong. I think sometimes my, my coordinators get sick of me saying, well, what about this? Um, you know, but ultimately I trust them to do their jobs and they get to worry about that. And I get to worry about structural things. And it's, it's kind of a cool challenge from a different perspective, you know, trying to maximize performance versus worry about scheme. Um, I still worry about scheme with special teams because that's my deal. I'm a special teams coordinator as well. Um, but, you know, diving in the X's and O's of that more, um, and all that stuff, but yeah, focusing on how do we get the most out of our, our, our guys in the program versus, okay, what play am I going to run in this situation? You know, I know all that stuff from having coordinated before I, I know some of it, um, you know, but at the end of the day, I let my coordinators coordinate and I just kind of chirp up when I feel they need to know something or need to hear something. And I get to focus on everything else. And now I get an off season to actually focus on everything else. So I'm pretty excited by that. Um. We had a summer season. We went one and five. Mm-hmm. So we we won the last game. We were nice. losing. We were losing 47-44 with two seconds left. We're on the 15, and we throw a touchdown pass to win. Uh, okay. and that's how we won. Um, for me, personally, as a run game coordinator, O-line coach, since we had such little time, I told the head coach at the end of the year, at the season, I got so wrapped up in scheme – like, do they understand why we're doing power? Do they understand why we're doing inside zone this way? Do they understand this? I have to show them how to do that for a moment technique. Like, mm-hmm. I didn't, you don't have to do all these crazy drills, but I got a little away from technique stuff. I was like, okay, everything's going to be group. I got to show them how we're going to block this. And I get so focused on it. And I think it's because we were so condensed. And I don't know if you guys went through that or if it was just me. I got so wrapped up in like, they have to know this. They have to know this. They have to know this. But then I got away from like, we got to work on your skip poles all the time. We got to work on, you know, how are we going to block inside zone with double team? Yeah. We got to do double team drills. I got away from that just being like, we're going to do it five on five all the time and we're going to figure it out. And I got away from scheme and I was like, I'm not doing that this year. But with, with everything crammed, <clears throat> I panicked. Yeah, I, I that's a great point. I think um... – you know, coming in, we had a certain idea of what we wanted to teach and it was different than what, you know, we've traditionally been gap scheme. You know, when I was a coordinator, I, if 21 personnel was how we, how we rolled, some of it was from gun 21 personnel, but you know, it was usually 21 personnel. We had a tight end in every snap and it was ISO power, um, you know, GT counter, GH counter, all that good stuff, play action passes, which, you know, I texted a guy the other day. I said, I decided the ultimate dream is to move to some rural school and just, build stud running backs and run gap scheme from 21 personnel until I die. (laughs) But, you know, 
realistically, um, you know, we made the transition. We talked about it in the off season last year, and we decided we wanted to move more towards a zone based offense for a, a long laundry list of reasons. Um, you know, so coming into the season, it was new for my O coordinator. It was new for my o, o line coach. It was new. You know, I was coaching receivers. It was new for me. Like I hadn't coached receivers in almost 10 years. Um, and when I did the first time I was on JV, so I'm sure it was not the greatest wide receiver coaching they've ever had. Um, you know, so a lot of it was new. And I think that's a great point. I think sometimes we got caught up in, okay, we need to have this, you know, we need to have access to this play. We need to have access to this play, which happens in a normal year. But I think with that condensed schedule, I think you're right. We were so worried about, well, we need to have these going into this game. We need to have these going into this game that we talked about technique, but we didn't really ratchet down on it. Um, and I think that was definitely a mistake. And, you know, that's something we've, we've decided going into this year, you know, we've narrowed down our run game. I think we're only at three or four concepts and our past game is not at a whole lot of concepts. And we're going to be more focused on uh, out formationing people um, and executing, you know, okay, these are the four run schemes we have, learn them. You know what I mean? Let's go over them. Um, one, you know, that said, we talked, I talked about things that worked, um, you know, about midway through the season, we realized we had been teaching zone five on five, right. Or whatever it might be. We moved to pods and that made a huge difference to working two man pods. So, you know, guard tackle working against their down lineman and their linebacker center guard and tackle tight end, whatever it might be. We started doing that. We saw marked improvement, of course, then injuries and eligibilities hit. And I had uh, JV lineman uh, playing against, you know, uh, guys twice their size, you know, again, it is what it is, but um, we found that was really successful for us was moving to that pods mentality and letting them work that way. And then, um, you know, same thing with, you know, I was talking to my old coordinator today and like, you know, coaching wide receivers last year, we always coach depth, right? Hey, you need to get to eight yards and bring it, bring it back to five. And the problem with that is like, you know, it, that sometimes you don't hit those markers. Right. But if I coach it up, does it really matter if they go right to eight? What happens if they go to seven and cut it back? I'm still going to get the same look, right? I'm still going to get by and large what I need. So we're talking about this you know, you go to teaching steps instead of uh, depth. You know what I mean? So, hey, instead of saying get to eight and cut it back to five, we're going to say, hey, take six steps, come back two. That's, you know, and, and then you don't have to worry because then a faster guy and a slower guy are on the same page. Yeah, a slower guy's not going to get as much depth, but he's still getting to the spot he needs to be for spacing. And that's, you know, part of it as well is, you know, we spent so much time in the past game, especially coaching, you know, get to these landmarks that, sometimes our spacing was all over the place because we were more worried about telling them how to get there versus just saying, get there. Um, you know, I was listening to an O-line coach talk the other day and I don't remember which one it is. I've listened to so many uh, things, right. That, you know, in the past year, you know, somebody was asking about footwork. How does he drill footwork? And he says, I don't give a crap about footwork. He's like, all I care about is can you get to that spot and block that guy? I don't give a crap how you get there. And I started thinking about that and like, yeah, that's a great point. You know, I coached O-line for years. Like, we harp and harp and harp, you know, bird dogs and first step and all this, that, and the other. And I think there's value to that. But at the end of the day, like, do we spend too much time hammering away at footwork versus working on, you know, what do you do when you get to that block? Um, you know, how, how do I navigate to that block? How do I get through traffic? You know, and that sort of stuff. And, you know, yeah, first step and footwork helps with that. Don't get me wrong but do we ratchet down on it too much to the detriment of something else that would make us better? You know, uh, we're really good at footwork. We just suck at everything else. Eh, you know, what is that doing for us then? That's a good point. Cause I kind of did the same thing where I just said, get there. And then they weren't, I had the opposite mm -hmm. problem. I said, get there. And then they weren't. So then I had to say, okay, how do I fix this? So like we ran ISO, we were big ISO. Mm -hmm. I saw a team we played this year run ISO and they'd had their outs. If we had an inside guy, a four eye or head up, they would gallop inside and kick out. And mm -hmm. I hadn't seen that. I've only seen the old veer get underneath and then kick out. So I started to just do gallops all the time. So yeah. if we were running any sort of gap, I would gallop. If they had nobody there, I said gallop to here, then here. And I found that to actually protect the gap. Because they were just churning and going and had their shoulders churned. So I had the opposite problem of like, I didn't spend any time on footwork. I just said, get there. Sure. 
Mm-hmm. And I had to be like, okay, I don't have to necessarily do the six inch step every day, but more of like put the bag there. They don't fall step. That's all I care about was don't fall step. And we protect the gap. Even on right. zone, we're protecting mm-hmm. the gap initially in the zone. So I did the opposite situation. Yeah. You talk about that gallop step. There's a team. Uh, I want to say it's Bryant. Maybe I don't remember. Um, when they teach outside zone, they have their line gallop step, you know, or they almost like, almost like they're skip pulling, you know, mm-hmm. the hop step across. And, you know, that's different than most how other people teach outside zone where you take that, you know, you bucket step almost, you lose ground to gain ground. But he said, by doing that, our shoulders stay square. We still get to where we need to be at a quick uh, rate. And we're still able to then run our feet, you know, outside zone. And I was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But again, that's different than how 99% of O-line coaches teach things because we're so married to our concepts. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, I think generally, it, you know, in football, and I would then extrapolate out in life, anytime you decide to focus on one thing, you're probably hurting yourself because um, you're you're giving up focusing on other things. Like, you know, said so you said, hey, just get there and didn't do the, the footwork. I think a lot of guys focus hyper focus on the footwork and, and miss out on what do we do when we get there. You know, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle, you know, trying right. to find that balance of, OK, how do we do a certain amount of, hey, get there. But at the same time, here's how to get there, you know, or better yet, here's the best way to get from point A to point B. If you take that information, and you tweak it slightly. So be it, you know, and your better athletes are going to do that. You know what I mean? Your better athletes are going to say, okay, this is what coach wants me to do, but this works better for me. And they're going to get there. I mean, how many times do we have that, that athlete who are like, man, he just does things so weird, but he gets it done. I don't care. Can you get it done? You know what I mean? So you provide them with that information and they take it and they modify it to fit their own behaviors and their own movements. And by God, you got something special at that point. I think the only time I got crazy on footwork was skip pulling for power. Mm-hmm. Now the head coach was the online coach here before, so I'm not talking bad about him. But on their <laughs> on their powers, they tried to skip pull, but there was a lot of times where they just turn their shoulders. And I'm like, no, we're mm-hmm. gonna skip pull. Your shoulders are gonna stay square. Your hips can move a little bit, but we're gonna stay relatively square. Well, why? This is what happened. Why? And I said, because power can hit in the A gap, B gap, or C gap. What? And I said, we're not gonna call 42 power, 44 power, 45 power. We're going to say power right or left Mm -hmm. because it might hit the A gap. I don't know how they're going to line up. I have a good idea, but I don't know how they're going to line up. So if we skip pull this way and stay square, and I told my lineman, now when they skip pulled, they they went to that old school when they moved their feet and their hands didn't move, you know, like the Mm -hmm. duck walk. I'm like, Mm -hmm. no, we can be athletic too. Run and run. So I teach you how to run, like how to move Mm -hmm. their arms. So that's the only time I got crazy on footwork was that. So you just called power right, power left, and basically, did you tell your was your lineman picking the hole, or was your back picking the hole, or was your full was your kickout guy picking the hole? Essentially, does that make sense? So, so, the, mm-hmm. so skip puller was finding the first open hole and going. Okay. So if it was power right, I did the traditional power right. So I told my guard, my right guard or my center, you know, he's he's head up or backside. So mm-hmm. one tech, three tech, he's got to get there. Yeah. Right guard, I said. You're you are on gap down backer. So if someone's on you, you got to get him. If somebody, if not, gap down backer. My tackle, I told him, gap down backer. So that's where that uh, I would have them gallop because mm-hmm. if there's a guy head up the guard, what if he loops? I don't want you yeah. sprinting to the backer. And so I'd have him go all the way across. But then this happened again a couple years ago. We that's how. But if that play side, Mike Backer was blitzing, my tackles wouldn't touch him because you were like, well, coach, you said gap down Backer to the other side. We weren't going to touch him. And he was making the play. So I finally just told my play side tackle, just go to that Backer. Mm-hmm. And my guard wrapping around would go get the other guy. And it just, hits, it just hits quicker. Mm-hmm. But we saw a ton of 3-3-3-5 three, 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 this year, more than I've ever seen before. You're going to see a lot more of it. That's, you know, the in vogue that and, you know, what what they're taking is they're taking the old. This is where it all, it's all related, right? Like when we moved to a four two five look this year, and then I'm listening to coaches talk. Oh yeah, we were four two five, and then we went three three five or three five three or whatever the heck you want to call it. Um, you know. So I don't know. I mean, it's 
I think everybody in our league almost exclusively is three, four slash five, two. I mean, I think us and there's one or maybe two other teams that are still even fronts, but everybody else is an odd front. And we were, we were odd front for four years with our last head coach. And, you know, for a variety of reasons, I just didn't care for it. But yeah, I mean, you're definitely seeing that happen a lot more. And honestly, that, that, that triple stack like that is kind of a pain in the butt to block. It's, it's just hard to figure out where the angles are. Um, now that said, if you get them washed, there's some huge seams. Um, you know, when we've both have been benefits of that and suffered from that when we were an odd stack like that. Um, but it does make it difficult to scheme against sometimes, especially if like that nose and that, that, you know, Mike backer for lack of a better word, if they're playing games where, you know, you're not sure which one's going weak, a, which one's going strong a, or, you know, whatever it might be, it can really make it hard to scheme up. Um, you know, but when you hit it, you're going to hit it big because it's, there's just, there's no second level defenders if they get washed. That's kind of when I came in and I told the OC and them, I'm like, I don't like numbers and run plays because mm-hmm. of this. If we're going to, they told me this conference plays a lot of three minutes. This is why I don't want numbers. I don't know where they're going to slant. I don't know where this is going to happen in the past two schools. If they had numbers, it didn't mean that's where it was going. It just told mm-hmm. them right or left. That's what it meant. I got you. Mm-hmm. And so I told the running back, I was like, you can kind of see where the hole is going to be before it happens. And so when the guard gets to that hole, you just follow him. And if not, there might be a cutback on power, actually, which we discovered. You might have a cutback. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And they had to discover that with this no nothing O line coach coming in, telling them this is how it's going to look. And same thing with zone. I was like, I don't, it's not going to be a hole. And I came in with zone looking like duo, which the Twitter world wants to crucify me for. <laughs> but that's just what we did. And it was simple. Now, mm-hmm. when we saw three, three or three, four, it looked traditional zone. It was literally, this is what it's going to look like. Yeah. But like week one, we saw a three, three stack. Week two, I saw a four, two, five. The next three weeks in a row, I saw a three, three or three, five. Never, mm-hmm. that never happened. And drawn up against, I love it. I love seeing mm-hmm. a three-man front for the run game. But like you said, if you got, I just talked to Nick Davis today, right before this earlier <laughs> today, and I blamed him for all these teams going three, three or three, five because he sure. Mm-hmm. I've known him for years, and I blamed him, and I said why, and he goes, well, I asked him. I he said, well, I think teams are realizing you can save defensive lineman reps, offensive line reps if they're going both ways. And I said, but when I coached the three, four, you had to have that big, mean nose guard. He goes, no, yeah, he goes, no, you can, they can be fast now. And that's what teams are discovering. Mm -hmm. I think is that nose guard can be 200 pounds. I I was talking to the D coordinator from uh, Shenandoah university. um, And he was saying their nose guard, they don't even really teach him to play a gap. They teach him going forward, just Mm -hmm. abuse the center. You know, and basically, you know, abuse the center, see which side he gives you leverage to, and then go. You know, and I'm like, especially like where they're talked about attacking his snap hand, and I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, it, that really does, quote unquote, I hate to use this phrase, dumb down that position in in a good way. Like, hey, go forward, man. You don't have to worry about you know shock, read, and shed. You know, you don't have to worry about slanting a gap. And I think sometimes, like, we do a lot of uh, you know a lot of slanting with our interior guys. I think sometimes when they do that, they slant so hard, they just wash themselves out of a play. Um, you know, that's something we have to address this year. Um, you know, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good point. And it's, you know, it goes back to, we were, we were really good in 2018. I hate to sound like one of those coaches. Oh, oh we were really good and keep bringing that up. Um, but, you know, we were in what I dubbed the power spread where we would be in 21 personnel out of gun. But then at the same time, we would go under center and just pound you with eye formation. And I would call ISO. And it was more like an insert zone. You know, I might call, hey, we're going to run ISO to the three hole. But my fullback would get up there and just find a seam and go get an inside backer. And my tailback would follow him. And what do you know? It actually worked out really well. So it's, it's, it's an interesting point. You know, maybe the next evolution of gap scheme, here we go, is instead of saying, you know, oh, the three back to the two hole or the two back to the three hole, however you number them, um, you know, it's just, hey, we're going to run ISO right. We're going to run power left. Um, you know, uh, we're going to run trap right. You know, and it, it, the hard part's going to be giving cues to the kickout guys. But, you know, anything anything else, I'm sure someone smarter than me can figure it out. You know, you just, 
hey, if we're running trap right, kick out the first guy past that strong A gap. I mean, that's yep. essentially, that was our rule anyway. If I called a hole, you know, if I called, you know, 23 counter, we're kicking out the first guy past the three hole. Well, if that's just your rule of thumb, you can just say counter left, you know, and, and that's a good point. And just saves a lot of wording and, you know, allows them to be more athletic versus coach said, I got to run the three hole, you know, instead of saying, Hey, there's a seam here, which isn't that essentially why we run zone? You know, isn't that essentially why teams went to zone was just to create space and allow a guy to get up in it, you know? So, you know, maybe, maybe you're onto something, maybe you just, you know, gap scheming and just calling sides is, is, you know, the weird bastard child of zone and gap scheme put together. And now you, now you just need to write books on it, record a DVD series and you can make a, <laughs> 150 bucks next week coach i think it's probably already out there somewhere i'm sure i've heard it heard it somewhere just yeah, rebrand it just rebrand it yeah yeah no a coach did that that i coached with everything was just we don't know where it's going mm -hmm. to keep the blocking rules the same we don't want to change it and we don't know where it's going we have no idea we can scout them all we want but they'll line up different somehow why would we tell our running back you have to aim for the two hole? Why do you tell right. them you have to aim there? Now you could tell them your aim now zone, you tell them your aiming point is here. Sure. But you're probably going here. Mm -hmm. When we ran ISO this year, we did the same thing. So if we had our H back, a wing back, two running backs, ISO right, my linemen were blocking to the other backer. He was aiming for that backer. And we told him that's where this is, might go. But since our inside zone blocking was exactly the same, except we wouldn't block the end on zone. Our running back mm -hmm. kind of knew, like, well, even though it's ISO right, if I see this gap to the left, I can cut it back. You if something it gets washed down. Mm -hmm. So I did that at a school a couple years ago. I did it the year before. And then coming in this year, it was a little different. They're used to, like, A gap, B gap. We're going to the one hole, two hole. Even mm -hmm. though they were, they were spread, they were still used to that. And I said, no, you can have numbers all you want, but it better be telling them which way to go. Yeah. Be That's because – we want our running back to play freely. We want our quarterback mm -hmm. to play freely of like, where is it going to go? You have an aiming point, but end of the day, you got to get yards. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I mean, that's, what did you run for outside scheme? What did you try and get so you could get to the edge? We just did power read. Um, okay. Off a of jet look or a, um, yeah. under, okay. Jet look. Um, I'm worried to do outside zone. I, I'm, I told him, I said, one of my weaknesses is that then we put in pin and pull later on. Mm -hmm. The stupidest person for pin and pull. <laughs> like, I I literally coach it like buck sweep. You know, where mm -hmm. if you call it to the right, you know, the guard, is somebody to your left? No, then you're pulling. Mm -hmm. Like, that's just what it was. The center, do you have somebody to your left? No, then the center's going to pull. Um, if you put a hand down tight end, which we would, if we had a hand down tight end to the right and we called pin and pull to the right, I would look at the tackle then. Do you have somebody to your left? No. Then you're pulling. The guard mm -hmm. could also not have anybody to his left. And now they're both going. Right. Like that would have another way to get it to the outside. But mm -hmm. it was just a lot of power read. And I was, me and wide zone don't get along. I researched it and stuff. But a part of me is like, eh. I kind of want yeah. to do. I kind of want to do my inside zone where if we, Ohio State does it a lot. Where I don't know. We called it at my other school. We just said eight, and that's just what it was. So the right tackle arced released, and everybody else was blocking inside zone left. Quarterback was reading the end. You know, if he went with the tackle, mm -hmm. he could keep it. If not, he can it off. Well, then that Mike Backer was usually the problem because nobody's blocking him. Right. So then you just put the running back on the other side, motion the H back. Now you've got the right tackle going out, running back going out, and you could hand it off to the H back. Mm -hmm. So now you're putting that Mike backer in a situation. Is he going to go with the motion or is he going to stay there for the quarterback keeping it? Right. So it was powery without the polar, but it was just different looks. That's how That's, we would get to the outside. Mm -hmm. There's a school near us called Oakdale that uh, they won a state championship back, I want to say like 16 or 17. Um, that's they. So what they do is they they'll run inside zone. So say they're running zone left, um, they'll have either an H back or uh, an offset fullback, and he will arc. They won't block the end. They'll leave the end unblocked. They'll arc release that back, 
And if the quarterback reads it, he now pulls it and he could run the alley with a lead blocker. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, and they do that with a jet look. They do it with an opposite H back look. He just comes under and wraps. They do it with a fullback look. And it's, you know, it's pretty nasty when it, when it hits, Um, you know, you got to have a dude who can tote the ball at quarterback, which is a whole nother story. Um, But yeah. Okay. That makes sense then. Um, You, cause that's always been when it comes to gap scheme, you know, and I'm talking traditional gap scheme, one of the biggest problems that they have is how do we get outside? Because in my opinion, you can't run toss anymore. I think mm-hmm. it's something you carry in the playbook just as a constraint play, but it gone are the days of running toss and it getting hit and big on the outside, unless they're just totally lined up wrong. But guys today are just too fast and they can pursue downhill too quickly that, you know, toss is not a hang your hat play. So, you know, what can you run to get outside? And yeah, you're starting to see a lot of guys run the jet. I mean, talk to some of those wing T guys and they love the jet from under center um, for obvious reasons. I think it's a great set. Um, you know, so that's something, you know, it could help out with gap scheme as far as getting outside, um, you know, but also to the point you said, you know, you know, what about combining a uh, wide zone in, in your, your, your ISO concept and saying, Hey, you know, we're going to call it wide ISO, you know what I mean? Or whatever you want to call it. And the aim point now becomes, Hey, you know, you're aiming off the hip of the tackle as the lead blocker or whatever you want to do, but because that's essentially wide zone, you know what I mean? If he sees the seam, he bounces it out and goes, if he sees the cutback, he bends it, you know, or if the tackle slash hand down tight end is able to get the wash, then you just bang it up in there. You know, I don't know, just, talking out my butthole right now i'm not gonna lie but uh, you know it just seems like an, an interesting possibility to me because that's always was my biggest problem running gap scheme especially under center like 21 personnel and stuff like that was how do you get outside um without it being a, a bounce off a counter or something like that you know we got a guy down the street who runs they run wishbone and they're running you know power 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 counter and they have some toss plays, but typically is not super successful for them. But they get outside sometimes on those counters because they get so many washes on the edge mm-hmm. that it looks almost like an outside run play. You know, so that's great and all, but that's not something you necessarily want to hang your hat on. Um, you know, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I was just curious because um, getting outside has always been the struggle of, of gap scheme without, you know, throwing a quick screen to the slot or something like that. Yeah, and then, then the OC wanted to really try – toss power read so like you're you mm-hmm. could like you know he wanted to get into that when, mm-hmm. when you have a condensed season yeah that's a rep based scheme <laughs> you, can't, you can't do that we could do normal power read mm-hmm. so then it, it then it kind of evolved into a speed option where you know if it's going to the left so offensive lines blocking whatever to the right let's just say it's mm-hmm. zone right they're blocking zone right quarterback and running back are going to the left because they're going to read that end yeah. So that's kind of where that came from. But he originally wanted to do that. So trying to teach the quarterback to fake pitch, plant and go was scary. You know, yeah. scary yeah. stuff. Like you said, condensed season. That's tough, man. Because that's, you know, we had a program around us that was running true triple for a while. And it's just reps on reps on reps on reps on reps. And then, you know, it, and it's it's a solid scheme. Don't I know the triple guys – They'll come at you with pitchforks if you talk bad about the triple, uh, especially if they're from South Carolina. But that's another story, um, <laughs> you know. But um, you know, it's it is a reps based offense. You know, our D three University down the street, they're pure triple, uh, and they've been really good at it. I think they made the Elite Eight uh, two years ago in in uh, D three. But again, it's just reps on reps on reps. Being able to make that speed read of that you know, five tech or whatever you're trying to read that day or the, the three tech on midline or, you know, like you got to learn to make those reads as quick as possible. And like you said, being able to plant, even on a speed option, being able to fake the pitch, plant and cut it up, man, that's a whole nother skill set that if you haven't worked on, especially if it's your offhand, like that's a big thing, you know, and if he's right hand, you're trying to run speed option left. Good luck, man. Like the pitch ain't going to be there. His cutback ain't going to be there. You might as well just lead block with the tailback and turn it into quarterback sweep. That That's why I didn't argue with him because I coached an option. I played in it. Mm-hmm. Speed options scare me. If that's not your offense, if you're not an option team, I just don't mm-hmm. want it at all. Like don't flirt with it. You got to marry it. It's, it's the option you have to 
marry it. You can't flirt with it. Sure. Because I, like you said, it takes a lot of reps. I don't care if it's speed option. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you run it once a game. You better practice it all the time. If you don't, and you just think the kid's going to – because I don't want to see the two-hand push. I've seen mm -hmm. that. It don't work all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. It turned into that or it turned into they would toss it. Our speed option was like a toss. And I'm like <laughs> – Rugby. Yeah, and I coached it. I'm like, no, 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 no. You got to do mm -hmm. this. I'm the old line coach telling the quarterback what to do. And I'm like, hold <laughs> on a second. I coach quarterbacks an option. This is what you do. So I hope we don't do that next year unless we go to option offense. But yeah, the only way we could thought to get it outside was power read, a little bit of that speed option. But it was bubbles and key screen. The, the and, standards, yeah. Mm -hmm. The standard outside game for spread offenses. Right, and we love the, the, the power read stuff because you could get the H pop involved. You could mm -hmm. get the tight end to wrap up and go. And so that's kind of what we looked at. And, you know, I want to steal stuff from Brent Deerman, like that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's what we looked at. And we'll see June 7th when they come in, we come in and we talk about what we're going to change. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> cause that's enough. Cause real quick, just cause I thought of it like trap. I brought in trap and they said, okay, Steve, how are you going to do trap? My world, we always want to trap the three tech. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the three tech, we're going to trap the five tech, the next right, guy over. Whole wide. So for us, we, my lineman, if we had a one tech, so we said trap left. If we had a one tech and a five tech. Well, we're going to trap the five tech. My linemen are yelling uh, pepper, which is telling my guard that's going to pull that it's going to be a far trap. So they're going pepper, 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 and they go. If it's a three tech, they're going to say salt because he's right there. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me where I came up with that. Some coach said it to me and I took it and ran with it. And it's alerting the guard like you're going to go far or short. Mm -hmm. Then when I was OC at a school, if I called trap, it was always trap check. It was never one way or the other. They told the quarterback, I want the three tech. So I could say trap check and I don't know where it's going. If the three techs on the left, it's going to go to the left. Yeah. And a lot of times I ran that out of pistol. I run other things out of pistol, but it was out of pistol, so the defense would never know. Mm -hmm. and we get, um, then if I figured out that the three tech was – the one tech was certainly with the running back, then I'd go offset. But if I didn't know, it was pistol. And I told the quarterback, you figure it out. Coach, well, if there is no three tech, just pick one way and they'll figure it out. <laughs> run it to the boundary. Run it to the boundary. Run it to the five strength. Tech. The strength is probably to the field. That's kind of our default setting. Strength's probably to the field, so run it to the boundary. Yeah, so that's what I brought in. I brought in some things this year, and I did not I did not get fired. So to me, I was like, okay, I'm not getting fired. There you go. Hey, that's a win column as far as I'm concerned. When we had our end-of-the-year meeting with the coach, it was virtual. And the first thing out of there, I was like, well, am I fired? He goes, not <laughs> yet. I was like, all right, I'll see how this goes. Yeah, Maybe I won't be fired. Yeah, wait till you uh, bring in the go-go offense. <laughs> that happened. Like, the head coach wanted to be spread and all that. Then there was a couple of times where he was like, well, what if we go under center? And I looked at him. I was like, no, no, we're not going under center. I'm not the OC, and I was making the call. I was like, no, you got to be one or the other. I don't, yeah. don't want to be both. You know, I, I've done both. I've been exclusively gun. We were almost exclusively pistol this year. Um I've been under center and I've also done both in the same season. And, you know, surprisingly when we were at our best, this is all because of personnel. It has nothing to do with scheme. Don't get me wrong. Was, you know, we were able to kind of go between being and gun. Now we had a center and this was the trick. We had a center who could get the snaps down on both. Um, and that's where we see, and I don't know, you know, I don't know what you see up there, but like if for some reason we have centers who can snap really well in, in gun, but can't seem to get the snap down under center. And we got centers who can kill it under center. It's like, you know, spray and pray when it comes to snapping to the gun. And, you know, there's all the techniques, there's the dead ball and there's this, that, or the other, but you know, it's just like, you know, we had a center, our first center this year, there was times it was sale of our quarterback's head. And then there was one game where he had perfect snaps every time. And I'm like, well, it's like, why don't you do that more often? Because the next game, it was back to being all over. You know, it was like a clock mm -hmm. wherever he wanted it to go in a, in a 12 to 12 hour radius. And it's just, you know, that's the hardest part. And that's, you know, I'm an old salty gap scheme coach. So I would always prefer to be in like my favorite scheme, believe it or not, is the Indianapolis Colts with Peyton Manning running zone from under center. I just love something about doing that. And I think, 
it sets up so many play action options that as a linebacker, because that, that outside zone footwork and the scheme is so long, you have to commit to it. And all of a sudden, you know, the guy's booting out and, you know, three guys are open and it's just, I love it, but it's, you know, I don't know how practical it is high school level wise to, to get to that just because of a variety of options. But, um, you know, I, I prefer under center, but you know, it's, it's, you know, the modern game, you can't really throw the ball under center as much anymore. You can, but it takes a lot more work. It's just like running an option offense, reps on reps on reps, you know, three-step drop, five-step drop. Whereas when you're in, in gun or whatever, like it's just catch the ball, catch the ball, take a couple feet, take a couple steps back and, you know, find your spot and sling it. Yeah. We were spread to run the ball. So people I've told like Banster on them, we were spread like, Oh, you guys passed the ball. I was like, no, Mm -hmm. we were run. And they're like, what do you mean? I was like, we ran the ball 70% of the time. Mm -hmm. Steve, you guys ran the ball. You like the air raid. I was like, I know we ran the ball. I was the run game coordinator. We're running the football. (laughs) And I had, I had a different O line lineup for each game besides the last two because kids went on vacation. They had vacations mm-hmm. bought a year ago. Their parents were going to be out the money if they didn't go, so they had to go. Uh, grades. And so my center left after week two. I had a different center. Oh, God. Let's just. <laughs> the first game, he, he could snap the ball well the first game, but he was slow. And even the ref came up to me and was like, you know we should throw a flag every time. He's doing it too slow. And I was like, well, thank you for not throwing the flag. <laughs> The next, the next game, it was in the dirt. It was above his head. It was to the right. It was to the left. So then I had to recruit a center, and that's my job this offseason is I need a center. And that's where I think that's where the under center thing came up. was like, we need to go under mm-hmm. center. And well, now you have to adjust everything week four to how to do it under center. Yeah, that's that's what we ran into is we, you know, we dabbled in going back under center this year because of our issues at center. And that's, you know, kind of what my OC said to me. He's like, that's fine if you want to do that, but it changes the the footwork and the timing and the steps on everything we do. And so we decided at the end of the day, like, let's just stick it out, stay gone, get through it, because reteaching everything, like you said, week three, week four, wasn't probably the best idea. Um, You know, but again, you know, it's just, you know, you, you make those decisions in the heat of the moment. You know, you, you make that decision of this is what we're going to do. And I think sometimes not making the change is almost as important as making changes and understanding when to make that change and when to stick it out and decide what's next and, you know, how to handle it when you have the time is is probably the hardest thing about coaching, um, you know, at least as the decision makers go. And then we had a problem with our foot or uh, spacing. I want three feet. They kept getting closer. So about mm-hmm. week four, I had enough. And I was like, five feet. I want the arms out. I don't want you touching fingertips. We got wide, and it just stuck. And the mm-hmm. running back looked at me in practice one day, and he goes, can this happen all the time? I was like, what do you mean? He goes, I can see everything. I can see where I'm going. <laughs> and so we just stayed that way. And then the linemen started to complain to me. Like, but coach, they're farther away to block. And I said, move. I don't know what to tell you. Move. Yeah. You couldn't double team them when they were close. Don't complain when they're far away. What's, you know, like the old Mike Leach thing, you know, look, if they line up on your right shoulder at three yards off, move out. If they keep lining up on your right shoulder, keep moving out. You know, it's different because he was throwing the ball. It was all one-on-one blocking. But, yeah, you see some old shots of, like, Texas Tech, and their tackles are, like, five, seven yards off their guards. You're like, that's crazy, but the ends weren't getting to the quarterback. No, I did that because if they gradually got close, I'm like, okay, if I tell them four to five feet away from each other, yeah. it will go to the three or four that I want because mm-hmm. they're kids. Um, well, I, w- I went over, Coach. I just realized that. It's all good. No, we were talking gap scheme. You're not going to stop me early from that. <laughs> I put something up on Twitter the other day, and I find it to be true. Like, you know, every time I start talking zone, I feel like Mrs. Doubtfire, you know, because really all I want to do is I just want to – put the ball in the dirt three yards in a cloud of dust and, and pound the rock. That's like, that's who I am individually as my personality. But I realize at the same time, that's not necessarily the recipe for success. Um, but God, I, I love just I formation, man. It, it's just, there's something about it. And, you know, 
maybe it's because I'm stubborn. But, yeah, no, so I love gap scheme. As much as I like zone and I love watching the big runs, man, I love strapping the football helmet on and saying we're just going to get it done. Well, that's why I don't know if I'm actually a zone person. I like to think I am. But when I show people the zone, I'm like, well, that's just ISO. You're not blocking the end. So I question it. I'm like, am I really zone or am mm-hmm. I just gap? And I'm telling myself because I'm not blocking the end. We're starting a new movement. We're the, we're the hybrid guys. The hybrid guys, yeah. We make it look like zone, but it's actually gap scheme. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> now we or, just got to get cards identifying ourselves. Yeah, I'm going to identify as this. Mm-hmm. Or or it looks like – I even told him, I was like, it looks like do or ISO to me. And I said I save time blocking. Like if the linemen know it's exactly the same, I just don't block the end on one play. Mm-hmm. I told the OC, you don't have to put an inside zone lock. Just call ISO, but if you go on a spread and there is nobody lead blocking, like if, if everybody else knows the play and you just tell the lineman ISO, you're good. You can still RPO it where you don't have to teach anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but we did go traditional inside zone the last game because of how they lined up, 65-yard touchdown run. So I was like, well, there we go. <laughs> Shows what we know. But it was a barn burner, you know, we scored 50 points, so it was a defensive battle. It was one of those defense optional games. Offensively, I loved it. I was like, we're scoring all the time. <laughs> You're like, I just need one stop. Well, the head coach was the DC, so there was times we look at it, I'm like, all right, we just need a stop. <laughs> and our headsets didn't work. The, the, the school is too close to a bunch of restaurants right behind it. So Man. those wireless headsets would pick it up. Mm. So we didn't have headsets. The other school did, but we didn't. So we're all on the sideline. OC's calling plays. I have to watch the signal caller to figure out what's going on. And if we need to stop from the head coach, I'm like, thank God we don't have the headsets on because he might hear me say it. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we don't even have a press box at our home field. So, yeah, we don't even have eyes in the sky. Ooh. Yeah, it's a mess. We don't have lights either. So we Ooh. play all our home. We play f- three or four of our home games every year on Saturdays at noon. But, yeah, so I know exactly what you're saying, even with headsets. In that environment, it's more like, hey, just run this play. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's not even worth chiming in on the headset sometimes. But. All right, Coach. All, right, yeah, coach. all your time. Uh, no, you're good. You're good. Like I said, I'm just going to go put my old behind the bed as the uh, gray hair of my coaching staff. So. Um, That's what yeah. I'm going to do. I'm, yeah. No. I'm so. going to go to bed. I appreciate you having me on, like always. You know, I like talk, love talking to you. So, you know, if you ever need time fillers again, don't hesitate to reach out because we can talk. We can talk something else besides gap scheme next time we come to another topic. We'll talk inside releases on the past game. That's what every it's really gets the people going from what I hear. Well, next time you can pick the topic. This is my Joe Rogan style. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, no, I like it. I like it. So I appreciate you, Coach. Thank you for what you're doing, getting all the uh, knowledge out there. All right. Thank you for being on here. Absolutely. My pleasure. I'll talk to you later.